Hi, I'm Ken Burns. I spent more than 40 years making documentary films that try to tell America's stories. I'm thrilled to welcome you to the third annual Student History Documentary Film Festival. What drew me to this kind of filmmaking, and what I hope inspires you today, is the fact that this is as close to time travel as any of us can get. That's pretty cool. The films you're about to see were made by middle and high school students just like you. While participating in National History Day, these students did extensive archival research, conducted insightful interviews, and edited these films together, each one telling a different story based around the theme, communication in history. After you watch them, the students themselves will tell you about how they made these films and what drew them to their specific subjects. This fascinating conversation will be moderated by Mike Mushan, whose regular job at the Library of Congress is to keep the miles and miles of historic moving image footage from all across our country safe, sound, and well-organized. It is my sincere hope that you will not only enjoy these terrific films, but that you may even be inspired to make films of your own that tell our country's stories, whether at the local or national level, and become time travelers yourselves. The great American writer Mark Twain is supposed to have said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. I think you'll see the ways that these subjects continue to reflect and play out in the world today. To explore other connections between history and current events, and to view the film clips from my films that inspired this year's theme, check out our website, unum at kenburnsunum.com. Congratulations to all of this year's National History Day winners for their incredible work, and I hope that you all enjoy that work as they take you on a journey to the past. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. I'm Mike Michon, head of the Library of Congress Moving Image section, and now we're going to watch the winners of the Next Generation Angels Award in the National History Day Senior Individual Documentary category followed by a Q&A with the filmmakers. In March of 1943, the curtain rose on what would become one of the most iconic and influential works in musical theater, Rogers and Hammerstein's Oklahoma, Based on a play by Lynn Riggs called Green Girl the Lilacs, Oklahoma wove together song, dance, and plot, painting a picture of romance and violence in the American Midwest. Defying musical comedy conventions of the time, Oklahoma's nuanced narrative and nostalgic subject matter propelled it to unprecedented levels of success, launching the golden age of Broadway and increasing the effectiveness of musical theater as a form of communication. Early explorations of the integrated song and storytelling structure in American musical theater were dominated by the European import of operetta, or light opera, exemplified by the work of Gilbert and Sullivan in HMS Pinafore and the Pirates of Penzance. Despite this early success, light opera's status as a Germanic-influenced foreign import presented cultural and legal barriers which only grew stronger with the outbreak of World War I in 1914, narrowing the scope of its audience in America. Following the end of World War I, musical theater of the Roaring Twenties traded story-centered operettas for extravagant dance routines and catchy comedic songs. Many shows, including the immensely popular Florenz Ziegfeld's Follies, were done in the review style, featuring a series of short, disconnected sketches enhanced by large sets, elaborate costumes, and scantily clad chorus girls. Racial caricature-based entertainment was also popular, with minstrel shows and a 1916 musical comedy titled Chu Chin Chow garnering loud laughs and large crowds. There were attempts to challenge these conventions, including the 1927 musical Showboat and English-language operas such as Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, which embedded their music within serious, often racially cognizant frameworks. However, these early 20th century explorations of plot-centered musical theater were swept away in a flood of Great Depression-era escapist entertainment, which continued to capitalize off of large dance numbers and light-hearted gags. 
In 1941, producer Teresa Helburn of the American Theatre Guild reached out to Richard Rogers and Lorenz Hart about adapting Green Grow the Lilacs, a play by Lynn Riggs which centered around the lives of settlers in the Oklahoma Indian Territory into musical form. Hart, uninterested in the subject matter, dropped the project, prompting Oscar Hammerstein to step in as lyricist and writer for his first ever collaboration with Rogers. The new Rogers and Hammerstein partnership strayed from the typical production process, prioritizing storytelling over showmanship, letting the plot, rather than Broadway musical conventions, control what happened on stage. Choreographer Agnes DeMille was hired to maintain the story's structural integrity through its dance sequences, and casting prioritized actors over singers, turning down big-name stars like Shirley Temple for more thematically appropriate choices like Joan Roberts. Oklahoma was not the first show to have a narrative, but I think I would say it was the first show to be ruthless about its narrative in the sense that if it didn't belong in the storytelling of the show, it was not included. Additionally, both parties could now work in their preferred order, with Hammerstein crafting the lyrics before Rogers wrote the score, aligning the content of the music more accurately with the story's context and character motivations. While production went smoothly, the uncertainty surrounding Rodgers and Hammerstein's collaboration style, the pressures of World War II, and the seemingly inane subject of Western ranchers made it difficult to find financial support. Philanthropist and well-known Broadway angel Howard Coleman turned the project down flat, while producer Mike Todd dismissed its chances of success entirely with the line, No jokes, no legs, no chance. When Oklahoma's curtain finally rose on March 31, 1943, American audiences were greeted not with scantily clad showgirls or dazzling kick lines, but old Aunt Eller churning butter on the front porch as the show's protagonist, Curly McLean, belted out the now iconic opening lines to Oh, What a Beautiful Morning. And it looks like it's climbing clear up to the sky. Over the course of its two-hour, 45-minute runtime, Oklahoma seamlessly wove hummable songs and eye-catching dance routines into a fully coherent, well-developed plot that, while exploring the romance between farm girl Lori and cowboy Curly, wasn't afraid to veer into darker or more abstract territory, showing on stage the death of main antagonist Judd and depicting Lori's internal conflicts and fears through an 18-minute dream ballet sequence. Oklahoma was highly praised for its refreshingly balanced integration of song, dance, and engaging storytelling. It relies not for a moment on Broadway gags to stimulate an appearance of comedy, wrote critic Lewis Nichols. Mr. Rogers' scores never lack grace, but seldom have they been so well integrated as this for Oklahoma. While the show received some criticism for its darker subject matter, with one audience member referring to it as loathsome, pestilential, and rotten, it appeased most viewers by smoothly transitioning between controversial and entertaining elements. One minute you've got this very risky dream ballet, and the next minute you've got a very traditional vaudeville number. So people are entertained enough to sort of take in the more complicated themes. In addition to its seamless execution, the show's optimistic portrayal of the rural heartland struck a chord with the American people amidst the turbulent atmosphere of World War II. Soldiers and sailors were given free passes to see the show, which became a poignant reminder of the American home front they were fighting for. War correspondent John Hersey later wrote to Rogers about a memorable morning on the Italian front. Everyone was grumbling as usual. Suddenly, the soldiers stood up and began singing, Oh, what a beautiful morning. There was a fair amount of irony in his singing, and his pals laughed. All the same, it was a beautiful morning, and all of a sudden, there was an almost unbearable intensity in the way the men looked around at the view. Oklahoma's combination of well-integrated storytelling and general American appeal brought it overwhelming success. 
it ran for an unprecedented 2,212 performances over the course of five years, grossed $7 million, gave rise to numerous revivals, spawned the new Oklahoma State song, pioneered the original cast recording, and even earned a Pulitzer Prize. Oklahoma became a hallmark of 1940s American pop culture. This groundbreaking domestic success broadened the scope of Broadway audiences, increasing the effectiveness of musical theater as a form of communication and jump-starting the golden age of Broadway. On top of expanding audience sizes, Oklahoma's deconstruction of existing musical theater conventions set a new standard of narrative-centered storytelling. And I think what Oklahoma said was that the American musical could tell stories. The stories that would have been quote-unquote impossible to tell, somebody is always saying, maybe music and dance could really propel this particular narrative to another time and another place. And I think it's the courage of Oklahoma to rely on the power of narrative that makes it such a groundbreaking show. This golden age shift from sensationalist to plot-centered shows popularized the use of storytelling devices which facilitated the creation of complex, often socially conscious narratives capturing the rise of Nazi Germany in cabaret, depicting taboo elements of 1960s counterculture in hair, and casting light on the struggles of the LGBTQ community in Rent. They create people who are confronting these difficult issues, and they don't just sort of lay out the difficult issues. They actually underlay that really with a person, a human being you can care about. And people, when they're not sort of hit over the head with something, but are actually allowed to think that a character is flawed, but not unlike themselves, then I think they've become very receptive to new ideas. In 2019, Oklahoma was revived, not as a glowing portrayal of the American Midwest, but a dark exploration of the dangers of community-sanctioned ostracization. Yet, this reinterpretation was made possible only through the precedent set by the original 1943 version. By kickstarting the golden age of musical theater, Oklahoma transformed Broadway into one of America's most effective means of communication, an endless source of social commentary and taboo topics made palatable for the public through catchy tunes and tight choreography. And so, with its flawless blend of nostalgia, music, and plot, Oklahoma raised the curtain on a new age of nuanced storytelling in Broadway, forever cementing its position as the American musical. Spreading hope across the Korean Peninsula in the early 1980s, the shouting man actively conquers the room with manse. Manse is a Korean exclamation that is used to express extreme delight, like Korean English. So, why is the man perpetually yelling manse to convey the message of reunion? What has played such a vital role in the recent events as its effects echo through the viewers of the video? The key to understanding riddled mysteries starts from unearthing one of the greatest television programs that has shaped the media communication of modern four state. Being a telethon for about three months on the same subject in 1983, the record of KBS specialized broadcast finding dispersed families is a vivid illustration that depicts the unparalleled impact of media communication during the aftermath of a sprawling world with fears of war, global peace, promotion, and universal love for humanity. Originally, the program was intended to air for just two hours. However, due to the overwhelming applicants of the program, the first broadcast ended at 2.30 a.m. with a promise to continue this program. The documentary hosted by Cho Jong Yu and Ji Yun Lee changed history forever. The duration of the program was 138 days, with airtime 453 hours and 45 minutes. 100,952 have applied for the reunion, and correspondingly, 10,189 families were reunited. These numbers only reflect families that are just in South Korea. The program is unique in that it used TV as a tool to reunite separated families. How did the tragedy of dispersed families occur? Its tragic history dates back to the Japanese colonial period from 1910 to 1945. 
Under the Japanese imperialism regime, Changshi Gaimyeong, or renaming Korean people's surnames into Japanese, were executed in order to annihilate the Korean culture and people. One of the causes of dispersed families originates from the surrender of Japan in World War II. After the Yalta Conference, the 38th Line was divided according to military convenience, temporarily dividing the nation, and still divides the nation as the South and the North, leaving behind dispersed families. Soon after the nation was divided, the North invaded the South in 1950 and started the Korean War. Consequently, the Korean War produced about 4 million casualties and 100,000 orphans, and about 10 million separated families on the Korean Peninsula. Before the utilization of the live TV system, there were attempts to find separated families through the People's Search section of the newspaper. But the low-income class couldn't afford to advertise in newspapers. In short, papers did not have a great effect. Moreover, people tried to use radio as a communication tool to reunite scattered families, but radio was also ineffective due to the bimodal frequencies of local and national. Also, it was impossible for people to confirm facial recognition through the radio. In the early 1980s, a great transformation in the history of Korean mass communication unfolds. Color TVs and telephones began to spread across the country in every house. The media communication technology of Korean broadcasting was also rapidly developing. The real-time live broadcasting network system of central broadcasting and local broadcasting was equipped. In addition, simultaneous real-time live overseas broadcasting has become possible through the satellite system. The development of media and communication, such as color TVs, telephone, national live TV programs, and satellite broadcasting networks were spread nationwide from house to house, creating numerous miracles. During the Japanese colonial era, a family who does not know Korean surnames meets, searching for separated families who immigrated abroad through satellite broadcasting. It wasn't just the family that this special live broadcast found. The program brought back the real names and identities of separated families. Kimshiganigohoshia. 이 방송을 시청하던 모든 국민들은 그냥 바로 맞다 맞아 닮았네. 그러니까 두 MC가 이것저것 하나 하나 챙겨서 질문하기 전에 벌써 화면에서 이렇게 보이는 거예요. The butterfly effect after the end of the live broadcast expanded further. It reopened the disconnected communication between the two Koreas, which was unimaginable during the Cold War. The TV program was key in sustaining the communication between the South and the North as South Korea used the program as a negotiating resource in their efforts to resume discussions with the North on reuniting families across the demilitarized zone. The first reunion took place from 20th of September to the 23rd, 1985. After the first meeting, annual meetings of the South and North occurred from the year 2000 through 2015. After 2015, meetings were not consistent due to the tense global affairs with the last meeting in 2018. With the miracle of the media, diplomatic and political negotiations have blazed the trail for enhanced relations. In addition to diplomatic influence, the TV program also had a tremendous global influence on the world. The program was broadcasted in 25 countries in real time as well as being screened at the General Assembly. The program became a hot issue and was also recognized by the New York Times, ABC News, NHK News, 
and other renowned platforms of media from various countries. In the short-term impact, citizens united as one to overcome the sad and angry history of the past. For this particular program, regardless of a person or a corporation, a tremendous number of people volunteered for the success of the program. Globally, the program awakened awareness of the Cold War and its parallel aftermath. I've heard about the program that uses television to reunite families that have been torn apart. I would say to them, whatever your political differences with the South, what harm can be done by letting the innocent families from North and South know of their loved ones' health and welfare? Full reunification of families and peoples is a most basic human right. The long-term impact of this program include ongoing use of the discussion forum on the Korean Diaspora website and the push for reunions of Koreans and global peace by U.S. Senators. The program was extolled by the world and also received many significant awards, including the Most Humanitarian Program of 1983 by journalists at the 6th World Media Conference and the Gold Mercury International Honor Award for Peace in 1984. Furthermore, the derivatives of the program, like the recordings and wall posters, became assets to the UNESCO Memory of the World Register in 2015. In fact, KBS Special Live Broadcast for Finding Dispersed Families was the origin of modern social media and FaceTime. People posted their messages on the wall and they met others through a screen. Those little posters, um, they conveyed a little bit of information, would get seen in various places around the country. You know, fast forward to today, how does so many people communicate on social media today? in a shorthand that we all understand. You text just parts of words, parts of let, you know, a few letters, an emoji, um, and your friends and your family get it. It seemed to me that was almost a precursor of how the internet would work, uh, you know, in our age. It only took one broadcasting program to shift the paradigm and ideologies of the world. KBS Special Live Broadcast for Finding Dispersed Families is evaluated as a good example of media communication that spreads the love of humanity and peace to the world and demonstrates the preserved value of communication, regardless of the form of tools from TVs to SNS and YouTube to even more innovative platforms in the future. So this great legacy of media communication must continue. Leningrad, 1926. Future Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin is flanked by four high-ranking officials in his inner circle. By 1940, three of these men had incurred Stalin's disfavor and were executed. However, eliminating his enemies wasn't enough for Stalin. He was only fully satisfied when he had also erased them from history. Joseph Stalin ruled the Soviet Union from 1929 until his death in 1953. To gain and keep power, he literally rewrote history, many times just as it unfolded. He falsified photos, film, art, and other media to communicate his visions, destroy his enemies, and build an enduring cult of personality. Stalin's falsification techniques are still echoed today, as photoshopping, deep fakes, and fake news are increasingly used to communicate misinformation and distort the truth. After nearly 400 years of Tsarist rule, the monarchy's unpopular decision to enter World War I, combined with crippling food and fuel shortages, created unprecedented unrest. The Tsar was overthrown, and Russia exploded into the 1917 October Revolution, plunging the country into civil war. A number of parties fought for power, but Vladimir Lenin's Bolsheviks emerged victorious. 
Under the banner of forming a classless society, they formed the Soviet Union in 1922. Needing a right-hand man, Lenin appointed fellow Bolshevik Stalin as Secretary General. Stalin was a loyal revolutionary and a strong organizer. Stalin developed an avid taste for power and began to cultivate his own political support and allies. However, Lenin became disillusioned with Stalin's increasingly rude and cruel behavior and wrote an official testament denouncing Stalin. But Lenin died in 1924, before the testament could be made public, and Stalin began his plan to take over. Stalin knew the power of an image. He knew that people didn't always believe what they heard or read, but they tended to believe what they saw. He wanted to communicate the message that he was the anointed successor of the deeply revered Lenin, so people would transfer their loyalty to him. Stalin actively encouraged the cult of Lenin worship that had sprung up upon Lenin's death, simply so he could inherit that mantle. In 1929, Stalin achieved his goal of leaving the Soviet Union, and was given status as Vozd, or Great Leader, equal with Lenin. To maintain his power and cement his legacy, Stalin began publicly communicating a wildly exaggerated version of his own status. Using government artists, Stalin falsely portrayed that he had been close to, and beloved by, Lenin. Stalin suddenly appeared in photos and art with Lenin, despite not being there in real life. He commissioned films that falsely depicted the leaders as close, like family, so he could gain reflected glory from Lenin's memory. Staged films also showed him present at battles he was nowhere near, to make him seem like a brave and supportive military leader. Artists refined his pockmarked skin, made his hair look thick and lustrous, enlarged his short physique, and even added a faint glow to make him appear godlike. The 1930s began arguably the worst period in Soviet history, Stalin's Great Purge. Stalin's media falsification took a more sinister turn. He vowed not only to physically eradicate his enemies and political challengers, but to also erase their visual existence from history. Stalin's feared secret police began mass arrests, from top political rivals, to people in his inner circle, to average citizens randomly chosen to fill arrest quotas. Many faced show trials and were executed. Millions more disappeared into the gulags, or forced labor camps. Stalin also ordered them to be removed from all official photos. He communicated the message that anyone who fell afoul of him or the Communist Party would disappear even from memory. It was like the plague spreading all over the country. A general plague of terror. When a person was arrested or executed, images of them became illegal. Disgraced people needed to be removed from photos before the photos could be republished or archived. This photo of secret police chief Nikolai Yezhov was carefully retouched after Stalin had him shot in 1940. Ironically, Yezhov himself had helped lead the purges. Less subtly, these party officials, executed as enemies of the state, were literally defaced, blotted out of existence with heavy black ink. Stalin expended special effort on erasing his main rival, Leon Trotsky, whom he discredited and exiled in 1927, then assassinated in 1940. Stalin wiped Trotsky's photo records so effectively that decades later, few Trotsky images remained in Russia. Stalin's Great Purge was inflicting widespread terror on his people, but perversely, he also wanted their love. He continued to build his cult of personality by publicly assuming a false, benevolent, caring persona, calling himself Papa Joe and father of little children. A famous photo shows Stalin beaming while holding Galia Markazova, the daughter of a Siberian party official. And now there was an illustration to prove that Stalin loved children. And this portrait could be seen absolutely everywhere. But the image it communicated was a lie. A year later, the self-named father of the little children had Galia's own father falsely accused as a spy and executed. Stalin's visual media falsification helped him fool the world into believing the alternate reality he communicated. 
Many Soviets also revered and celebrated him even as his brutal regime killed almost 20 million fellow citizens. We really believed that all this happened without his knowledge. We were firmly convinced that he was a saint, the most holy one, the only one who could possibly save us. Stalin rewrote Soviet history when he made his victims disappear, not only their bodies, but also all proof of their existence. Unless photos were hidden or sent to the West, little record of their lives remains except a dark blot or a scribble on a page. Many average citizens no longer had a family pictorial history. To protect themselves from the secret police, people inked or cut out faces of the disgraced. Sometimes all that was left of a parent was a photo of their hand. Stalin also significantly impacted Soviet art history, as he insisted only the socialist realism style could be used to communicate his false reality. This showed the world the Soviet ideal of happy workers laboring for the good of the collective, when in fact millions died from forced collectivization. The Soviet Union maintained a positive international reputation, largely thanks to Stalin aggressively censoring all visual media. This concealed that forced labor was behind his industrial progress. He also made scripted films of model farms to falsely communicate that collectivization was a success, and to hide the horrific Ukraine famine. Stalin ensured there is no honest newsreel footage, only his fake narrative. After Stalin's death in 1953, his successor, Nikita Khrushchev, denounced Stalin and tried to undo the false visual history he had communicated. Khrushchev removed pictures, tore down statues, and even edited Stalin out of his own propaganda films. But Stalin's false narrative has regained strength. Polls show 70% of Russians now think favorably of Stalin for his industrial progress and war victories. Many younger Russians are unaware of the horrors he committed. The effectiveness and lasting impact of Stalin's false visual communications campaign shows how powerfully convincing an image can be. Today, people are increasingly bombarded by fake images and misinformation campaigns on the internet and social media, some echoing Stalin's own techniques. High-tech photoshopping and deep fake videos can create and communicate a false but extremely believable version of events. Although tools like forensic image analysis and fact checker sites can help detect fakes, people need to be aware of manipulated media and seek a variety of original sources. This is a key step in holding world leaders more accountable for their actions. Learn from Stalin's falsified communications campaign. Don't believe your eyes. I'm now joined by the filmmakers, Sasha Allen from Minnesota, Ryan Kwan from Korea, and Melinda Chen from New Jersey. I also want to remind you that we welcome questions in the uh, Q&A, so you'll find a button there in your Zoom screen. Please ask. We're happy to answer those questions. So my first question is for you, Sasha. Uh, where did you get the inspiration from your film, and why did you choose documentary? Yeah, um, I found out about my topic from a book called The Commissar Vanishes by the late British photographer, graphic designer, and author David King. Um, I used some of the images from this book in my film. I had been reading a book by the late Soviet dissident Alexander Solzhenitsyn and was actually considering that as a potential History Day topic when I found this book on the same shelf. Uh, I, when I saw the before and after images of how people vanished and read King's description of how and why Stalin falsified visual media, it really drew me in. Fake news was also becoming a huge problem at the time I was choosing my topic, so I felt it was very relevant. This is actually the third documentary I've made for National History Day because I really love the process of making them. I feel that a good documentary can really immerse you in the story with images, sounds, and words. Yes, yeah, so I want to uh, pick up on what you were just saying about um, 
the context in which you made this documentary. And there's a lot in the news about deep fakes and fake news and, and things like that. And your documentary addresses those pretty forthrightly. Did that have an impact on how you approach the making of the documentary and what you talk about? Um, in, in what way, sorry? <laughs> No, just, you know, with with all of that in, you know, current events and things are in the air, uh, did that have a, an impact on, on, you know, why you even chose the topic to begin with and the way, you know, you structured it to, you know, bring this story of Stalin and the falsification of history into the current day? Yes, I would say that this topic really serves as a warning. This falsification has been going that we see in societies all over the world today has been going on for a very long time and it's important to be an informed consumer in the media and make sure that what you're reading and seeing is really true thanks uh, ryan uh, you have a very personal connection to the story that you're telling and dedicated it uh, to your great grandmother uh, is that why you chose this topic to begin with Yes, that's the reason why I chose my topic. So I grew up hearing the story of my great grandmother about her two lost sons who got separated from her during the evacuation to, to Seosan in 1950 during the Korean War. And it was her lifelong wish to find them. My great grandmother passed away in 2016. My mom told me numerous times about the times when she and her parents went to a broadcasting company that broadcasted a TV show that helped find families who were separated during the war. They would visit the broadcasting company the entire summer in 1983. So that's how I became familiar with the story. Then in 2014, I watched a Korean movie called Ode to My Father, and it was about a guy finding his sister who was separated from him during the Korean War. He found his sister through the same TV show that my mom was talking about. It was called the KBS special live broadcast, Finding Dispersed Families. Through the movie, I was able to understand what my mom grandmother, and my great-grandmother went through. I also realized that an individual's life basically comprises a part of history. Ever since then, I conducted personal research on the TV show. And when I decided to enter the 2021 NHD, whose, me, whose theme was communication history, I immediately knew that I was going to make a documentary film. I wanted to make a documentary film to continue the legacy of the show KPS Special Live Broadcast, Finding Dispersed Families, and also to let us remind ourselves of the tragedy so that we don't repeat the same history. Was it personally rewarding for you to tell this story with which you have this very intimate connection? Yes, it was because it helped, because like after hearing, my, hearing the story of my great grandmother, I wanted to sh share the pain that many like Koreans felt because of the Korean War and how much they lost and how it still affects us today. Thank you. Uh, Melinda, can you walk us through your process uh, a little bit? Um, you know, the creation of an outline, uh, you know, and, you know, the various edits that you had to make, the process paper. I, you know, I know it's an, an iterative process, so you had to make changes throughout the various stages of competition. Can you walk us through that a little bit? Of course. Um, so evidently the process of making an NHC documentary begins with picking a topic. And for me, this is the most important part. Um, and you have to make sure that whatever you're doing your documentary on has to be something you're extremely passionate about um, because you are doing it for the next year. Um, after that, I usually start off with some level of ground research, which involves usually finding secondary sources. Um, like websites and also books, please, please, please use books. Um, and this is sort of where you start forming your basic, um, your basis or your, your basic thesis and picking an angle with which you want to attack your project. Um, and after you've sort of determined your angle, this is where you want to dig deeper and essentially figure out where the holes in your project are. And the way you patch those holes is by doing primary source research. So um, it's really helpful to go to an archive to look for original documents, try to find interviews um, and try to really dig as far as you can in this stage. Um, and after you feel as if you have enough resources to really understand your topic, you can start drafting an outline looking for 
the visual resources that you need to actually demonstrate in your documentary. And after that, you can edit your video. And if you make it through the first level of competition, this is really where you get to the spicy part of making um, your projects, where you can start really editing and looking back at your old thesis and figuring out the places in which it really fails to capture the topic and making improvements upon those. And actually, I find that's my favorite step, the parts where you start adding nuance to your project. Great, thank you. Uh, a reminder to everybody, you are more than welcome to uh, answer questions of, or ask questions of the filmmakers and we'll be sure to relay to them. But uh, Sasha, jumping off of what Melinda just said there, uh, can you talk a bit about the strategies that help your research process? Uh, yes, I'd like to talk about something that helps me manage my research sources. I always end up using a ton of sources, including books, articles, website, images, and film. And it can be really hard to keep track of it all. As you probably know, it's a required part of History Day to submit an annotated bibliography because it helps the judges understand the scope of your research and how you used and understood it. But I also use the annotated bibliography to keep myself organized and keep my research organized as I go along. When I find a good source, I immediately write it down into a document and add brief bullet point notes underneath. Uh, um, they, these will cover anything interesting I found in the source and also where in that source I found it. This is especially useful when I'm watching film. If I find something I want to later download and clip, I'll write down the timestamp and what that thing was. It saves me a ton of time because I don't have to go back later and rewatch or read re read things, sorry, but I can go straight back to my source and pinpoint the information I need. And at the end of my project, when I'm finalizing the bibliography, I will expand the bullet point notes into complete sentences and add in any other information that will be helpful for the judges. Great. Can you talk to a little bit about the technical uh, aspect of making a documentary? Yeah, definitely. One of the things that's great about making a documentary is that you can have so much fun with the technical aspect. You can be creative with the special effects, your music, transitions, and how you organize your film. You don't need expensive or complicated software to do this, although if you have that, that's obviously great. Um, also, make sure you leave yourself enough time to have fun with this part, because it's one of my favorite parts of the process. So how many times did you, uh, through the competition process, did you have to make changes to your documentary? I'm constantly making changes, always finding things that I want to develop, um, especially with feedback I get from judges, family, the mentors at History, Minnesota History Day. Great. So Ryan, where did you, your, your documentary had a lot of footage in it from uh, the television program. So uh, where did you, where did you find that? And how did, how did you source that? So the enormous, the, the enormous amount of primary sources were archived on the KPS archive website. And I was fortunate enough to have found it. The duration of the TV show like, was like 138 days with an airtime of 453 hours and 45 minutes. It was difficult to find the entire video footage initially, but I was able to get hold of a KBS, KBC archivist, Jiyong Lee, who helped me find the important videos that I, I wanted to use for my film. Sorry, I mean KBS archivist, Jiyong Lee. And the picture I dedicated the film to at the end belonged to my great grandmother. And it was used to find on the show by my great by my great grandmother and my mom and my mother. Right, uh, Melinda, you all all of you, you know, it included some uh, some interviews uh, with this. But I wanted to ask you specifically, Melinda, about your the interviews that you included in your documentary. Why did you choose to to do that, and how did you identify the people that you wanted to interview them and then and then contact them? Yeah, so for me, I usually use interviews for two functions. The first one is essentially to fill a gap in my research. So if I'm not sure about a more obscure element of my project, I'll often look for an interviewee or an expert to really help me flesh that out. Um, and also, uh, I use interviews to validate and justify my thesis because 
Um, these people have been doing research on these topics for far longer than I have. And oftentimes it's really nice to get an opinion from an expert. So in my case, uh, my first interviewee, Professor Jones, was more of the first in that he offered new perspectives that I hadn't thought of, um, while Professor Maslon was more of the second. And I found them both because they had authored sources that I really liked and wanted to know more about. So Professor Jones really helped me to understand the specific ways in which musical theater impacts people emotionally and helps to change their perspectives on topics, while Professor Maslon helped, um, under helped me to understand what set Oklahoma apart and allowed me to add a little bit more nuance to my project and clarify the specific things that Oklahoma did differently. Um, and so in addition to adding his words to my documentary, the act of simply sitting down and talking to him for an hour really helps to work out the kinks in my thesis. Great. So we have a question specifically for you, Melinda, uh, in the uh, Q&A. We encourage people to keep those questions coming in. Uh, in, your, uh, in your first answer, you are quite emphatic that people should use books as primary resources. Uh, and so the question is, why do you feel so strongly about that? Um, well, I mean, I, I usually use books as secondary resources, but they can be primary. But I find that um, there's a couple of things that books contain that gives them a slight advantage over websites. The first one is usually books are very, very, very well sourced. So whenever you read an academic history book, you will usually find a, a massive appendix in the back in which the author cites all of their sources, newspapers, interviews that they did. And that in itself is an extremely good resource. If you're ever stuck and you don't know where to find sources, you can always go to a book on your topic and look at where other people looked. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is um, generally I find that books because of the time it takes to publish them because it's been through so many levels of editing are um, you'll generally find a slightly more concise or better structured picture of a topic rather than if you sort of go on a random Google search, you'll often find um, slightly more uh, disparate information and oftentimes it's harder to see the big picture that you get from a book. Thank you. Sasha, a question for you. Where did you get the background music for your documentary? Um, my background music is all taken from the library of the software I used, which is Video. Great. Is that the uh, the software that you use to edit your documentary? Yes, it is. Well? The software okay. I've used all three years. It was provided to my school by a grant through the Minnesota Historical Society. Very good. So all of you are veterans of uh, National History Day and making documentaries. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm curious, is there are other students out there who are thinking about doing a doc, maybe they've never done one before. What are some, some tips and tricks and suggestions that you would have as they're really pondering whether or not they want to do this? Ryan, how about you? Uh, I would like tell them like, I would I would tell them like to maybe look around and maybe like see like see like oh that even though I don't have a topic I can I can like actually find or do it's it can we can still find one that's around us like think back to our family or like think back to like the community that we live in and we can use like well like what what we can relate to in order to like trying to like find ours the, the topics as well as like the details that we want to like share and be passionate about because people can people can people can like relate to each other based on like their own backgrounds and like in their history and as well as their parentage or lineage this can be this can be applied to this this can this can help and apply to students who wish to like find something that they will that they really want to work on so we have a very specific question for you, which is how you identified the people uh, in your documentary that you wanted to interview. That's for you, Ryan. Yes. So first of all, first first of all, the, the people that I interviewed, I would like, I would like look through and like try to find, like find out like who were who who were who were who like major figures. In part of the, in the in part of the KBS like TV 
the TV shows like special live broadcast to find dispersed families. And I would like try to like look into their information. Like one of them was like Mark Lickie and the other was like Jian, Jian Lee. Great. Melinda, uh, back to that question about the tips that you would uh, give to students who are thinking about doing this. Um, you know, what, what, what sort of advice can you provide? Oh, the first piece of advice is definitely time management. I'm sure this has been conveyed to you guys many, many times uh, in many, many different forums, but time management is really, really important, especially when you're working on a big project. And the reason why I'm allowed to say this is because I've been on both ends of the spectrums. I've had years in which I felt as if I was really, really organized and on top of my game. And I've had years in which I was literally starting my documentary two days before the deadline. Um, and I will say that the first type of organization is significantly more fun and relaxing than the second time. So being on top of your organization is a really important thing. Um, another tip I would give is definitely as you're doing your research, be extremely open to new perspectives and new ideas because oftentimes that's where the interesting part of your topic lies because even topics that seem basic or seem like they've been completely explored from every single angle often have a little bit of nuance. And when you find that, um, that's usually where, you know, the best part of the topic is or the part that's really interesting to you is. So whenever you find something that's weird or doesn't really quite match with what your preconceived notion of the topic is, I say always go deeper, always look for more information on that. Are there instances in which the resources that you're finding sort of drive the way that you craft your script or I, I'm just curious where you start you know is it you start with a script and then you find images to match it you get images and then you're writing a script to match those Sasha can you talk about that a little bit I'm sorry I thought the question was really would you mind saying one more time no sure of course not um and I'm sorry I should have prefaced prefaced that I'm just sort of curious in the relationship between the script or outline that you write and then, you know, how, and then the images that you're able to find. You, for example, started with a book, you know, you had a book that had images in it, but obviously you had to flesh that out a lot to provide a bunch of context to it. So I'm sort of curious if the, you know, if you started with an outline and then we're looking for images to match that or if you were just finding images and you wrote your script around that? I actually was doing both at the same time. Once I had my outline and had flushed it out into a full script, I made a storyboard, which was just a table with sections of my script on the left and the descriptions of images I wanted to have on the right. The images, sometimes the images I found influenced what I'd written for a certain section of the script and other times what I had written in the outline for the script I looked for images to match that text. Right. Melinda was that sort of the same process for you as well? Um, For me I typically start off uh, doing sort of a timeline of my topic so I'll basically write out the important events that relate to it and I'll fill in the visual media afterwards. Um, but for the most part, it's similar. Great. So Ryan, uh, I'm curious as to, you know, what kind of advice that you got from your teachers and others as you were working on your documentary? So like the advice I got from my teachers was like to, so it sounds like most of like today's like sources and things that we normally normally use as like relate to like digital media they advised me to like try to learn more about digi digital media more and try to apply like technical things so i can be able to, to like portray my information more accurately and they even taught me to like focus on trying to find more on my like primary sources which i can like help make my information as i explain like my topic in, in order to make it more credible Great. Uh, Sasha, we have a specific question for you. Where did you find the clips in your documentary? Um, my footage all came from YouTube. Some of it was raw footage from channels like British Pathé, 
and some of it what, where I couldn't find it anywhere else, I took footage from old TV programs or old documentaries. My modern day footage is also from YouTube, from modern news programs and things like that. Uh, Melinda, uh, why do you think it's important to study history? Well, for me, I think history is a really good way to develop um, a framework through which we can view the present. And I think uh, specifically with respect to National History Day, I've learned a lot um, about very, very specific topics that definitely don't get taught in history class that have sort of um, opened my eyes, I guess, to the ways in which uh, I guess our history curriculum sort of brushes over certain things. I guess one example that I can remember off the top of my head is a pretty common National History Day topic is the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, which I knew nothing of before I started doing this competition. Um, and just learning little tidbits like that, not only do they make you a more informed citizen, but they also um, allow you to see patterns in, as Asha's topic sort of touches on, when things that happened in history are now reoccurring and it sort of informs your ability to respond to those things. Are you a fan of musical theater? Yes, I am. <laughs> that, that's actually the reason why I asked that is because it's one of the things that uh, I particularly enjoy about all of your documentaries is that, you know, you come at these from, you know, different perspectives and it, it really informs, informs the documentaries and their, uh, so incredibly well done and, and entertaining. Um, and you learn a lot from them. So that kind of leads me to my, my last question here is, how did this work affect you personally? Sasha, can you start with that? I think learning about falsification has made me more aware of what I read and see online. It's made me more conscious to check sources and make sure that what I'm seeing is true. Brian, how about you? Yours is a very personal story. Yes, <clears throat> yes. Like, it's like presenting the information regarding my, regarding like the, the KBS like special life, like broadcast program, as well as like the struggle that many Koreans faced based on like how they wish to like reunite with their families. It, it kind of like it kind of like it kind of helps me helps helps me remember like my great grandmother who died in 2016, and I just wanted to show like how how much how important that that the event was in like trying to like help like reunite the Korean families with the use of technology, and I still feel bad that my great grandmother like she never managed to find found find her missing last two sons, and I still want to like honor her memory by, by like making this documentary, as well as honoring those who've reunited or weren't, be, weren't able to be reunited with their families because of the Korean War. Well, thank you all so much. Sasha, Ryan, and Melinda, really thank you for spending time with us today. And congratulations again on your achievement. And thanks to all of you for joining us today and good luck on your National History Day projects.